Chapter 4.8 Dysfunctions of Abstract Power Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Robert Ingersoll Reference 103 Now that we have explored how abstract power hierarchies are created and utilized by modern human society, we can discuss how and why they become dysfunctional. As a warning to the reader, this section and the next section consist entirely of politically and emotionally charged concepts. The purpose of this discussion is to explore the question of why humans fight wars as thoroughly as possible. This will lay the conceptual foundation for understanding why people might consider using soft warfighting protocols like Bitcoin. If the theory presented by the author is true, that Bitcoin represents a soft form of warfighting, then a general explanation about the common dysfunctions of abstract power hierarchies and why people feel compelled to fight wars should double as an explanation for why people might feel compelled to adopt Bitcoin. The main takeaway from this section is the dysfunctions associated with abstract power hierarchies are very similar whether those abstract power hierarchies are encoded by rules of law or they're encoded by software. In both cases, there's a reason why humans eventually become so frustrated and discontented with their existing abstract power hierarchies that they pivot to use in physical power to settle their property disputes and secure the policy or property they value. A secondary takeaway from this section is that the reasons why people become frustrated with their abstract power hierarchies are likely going to remain the same no matter if the resources under people's control are physical, land, or digital bits of information. In other words, the same reason why people will feel compelled to project physical power to secure physical property will likely be the same as the reasons why people would feel compelled to project physical power to secure digital property. Chapter 4.8.1 It's important to acknowledge that our modern agrarian way of life has a dark side. When hunting a pack of significantly more powerful animals using nothing but rocks and spears, each human's individual contribution to their small Paleolithic tribe matters, and no single person wields appreciably larger amounts of physical power than others. Within these small tribes, survival depends heavily upon forming deep, lasting, trusting relationships with peers. Effective communication becomes an essential imperative, and prosperity depends upon adopting flat organizational relationships, which optimize for the lateral transfer of knowledge. Reference 68. This is one of many explanations for why atomically and behaviorally modern Upper Paleolithic sapiens lived in highly egalitarian and non-hierarchical societies, as evidenced by how they buried their dead. In contrast, when living a sedentary life of comfort, complacency, and resource abundance, it is possible to aff afford to be more isolated from each other and adopt inegalitarian relationships which optimize for hierarchical command and control. The way sapiens organize themselves changed dramatically during the transition from the Upper Paleolithic Era to the Neolithic Era. Sapiens started to believe they were metaphysically transcendent to their natural environment. They started believing in imaginary powers which quickly blossomed into belief about god kings. They began to forfeit their physical power in exchange for abstract power, trading their highly representative and egalitarian resource managed systems for non-representative, inegalitarian, and systemically vulnerable abstract power hierarchies with imaginary power and resource control authority split across imaginary positions and silos. These abstract power hierarchies were intentionally designed to give a select few members of the population sustained and unimpeachable control authority over the population's most valuable resources, using an imaginary source of power and authority. When these new types of abstract power-based dominance hierarchies formed, sapiens stopped hunting for food and started hunting for abstract power and resource control authority for each other's resources instead. Pause right here.
Why did they do that? That's because their neighbors benefit to cost ratio attack had just become super high because they had more resources than they could defend. And if you make your resource abundance so much that you can't defend it, what choice do other organisms have when they can't get those same resources out on their own, but to come after yours for their own survival? Back to the text. People were particularly interested in gaining control, authority over irrigated farmland. They stopped hunting for caribou and started hunting each other, all for something that which exists only within their imagination. This would imply that much of what modern agrarian humans fight over today are, ironically, the special permissions and authorities granted to high-ranking positions of power hierarchies. Abstract power hierarchies, which ostensibly exist to mitigate the need for us using physical power to settle disputes and establish our dominance hierarchy. See the problem? By trying to create systems where we replace physical power with abstract power in order to reduce injury and interspecies fratricide, human society ended up creating a system where we fight and injure each other at unprecedented scale for access to abstract power. At first, the spread of agrarian society was constrained to river basins and much of nature was safe from their exploitation and abuse. But the invention of the plow and the enslavement of a rocks to pull the plows, sapiens were able to dredge up nutrients deeper in the soil. Combined with the discovery of irrigation, this allowed sapiens to irrigate land further away from river basins, enabling agrarian society to spread inland. In the wake of agriculture came artificially partitioned sections of land generating enormous amounts of resource abundance. As resource abundance grew, the need for resource control hierarchies grew. This was far less of an issue when sapiens were still highly nomadic because they owned relatively little possessions. To that end, sapiens invented abstract power hierarchies to manage control authority over their agrarian resources, namely irrigated land. They created imaginary power and authority in the form of rank and title to serve as a surrogate to real power. As Charles Foster summarizes, with title came a sense of entitlement. Reference 68. Sapiens started to feel superior to their fellow humans because of systems they developed to take account of their excess resources. A consensual hallucination emerged that sapiens have an inherent right to rule over nature. Perhaps even more absurdly, the self-worth of entire sapient populations became tied to how much rank and title they have. To paraphrase Foster, after the emergence of domestication and agriculture and abstract power hierarchies, the growth rate of sapient brains started to reverse course and to shrink, as all animal brains do when they become domesticated, even in fish. Fish brains are already so small. They become smaller from living in your tank, in your living room. Your fish are stupider than fish in the wild. Highly infectious diseases emerged. Famines emerged. Occupational diseases emerged. Dietary deficiencies emerged. Iron deficiencies emerged. Severe mental health deficiencies emerged. Close-minded and intolerant monocultures emerged. Political competitions and infighting emerged. Excessive resources gave rise to excessively large tribes. Populations grew so large that sapiens started to experience something they hadn't experienced before. Anonymity. The ability to be anonymous in excessively large tribes translates to the ability to prey on tribe members without the natural deterrence of social and reputational damage. Consequently, crime emerged, and with it the need for a formal mechanism of deterrence and delivery of punishments. Police emerged, and with it came the systemic vulnerabilities of the police becoming criminal organizations in and of themselves giving rise to one of many forms of corruption within abstract power hierarchies. 
I'm sure you all can think of more. On top of all these other features to blossom from the fertile soil of modern agrarian society, so too did the profession of warfighting, a far less lethal byproduct of agrarian society in comparison to infectious disease, dietary deficiencies, and famine, but one that seemed to get far more people's attention. Reference 68. During the transition of sapient social organization from egalitarian hunter-gatherers to farmers and god-kings, our fossil record indicates that despite their natural instincts, humans started killing each other far more commonly and at unprecedented scale. It appears they started fighting each other so they could have imaginary power and control authority over their agrarian resources. They started fighting for the right to define what right is, as well as for the right to write the laws of their abstract power hierarchies based on what they define right to be. During the Upper Paleolithic era of behavioral modernity, evidence of human-on-human -human killing is minimal. But during the gradual transition to the Neolithic era, evidence of killing accelerates alongside the emergence of agriculture and their corresponding abstract power hierarchies. These observations are noteworthy because they illustrate how massive scale human on human killing didn't appear to become popular until after domestication, after sapiens started believing they were superior to nature, after the emergence of rank-based dominance hierarchies, and after sapiens freely chose to adopt sedentary lifestyles, which give unprecedented amount of asymmetric top-down command and control authority over people's valuable resources for nothing more than imaginary reasons. Reference 68, 70, 22, and 104. Once these new characteristics of human society emerged, leisure time, that precious limited resource needed to establish one's own experiential knowledge and meaningful emotional connections with other sapiens, disappeared. It only takes three weeks for one farmer with a simple flint sickle to harvest enough cereal for a single family to eat over the entire course of a year. But farmers labor year-round, spending most of their time growing and harvesting grain for people they will never know. Reference 68. If a Neolithic farmer were to travel back to the Upper Paleolithic era and make an attempt to explain how agrarian society functions to a Paleolithic hunter-gatherer, the farmer would have to explain how sapiens decided it was a good idea to stop roaming the land and start spending the majority of their lives in one place, laboring to produce unnecessarily large quantities of food for strangers, while simultaneously fighting and killing each other at unprecedented scale because of abstract belief systems, where strangers wield imaginary power and control authority over the resources they produce for ideological reasons. And what motivates agrarian populations to do this? So they can strive to afford the luxury of a fraction of the amount of leisure time, travel, freedom, lack of infectious disease, and meaningful interpersonal connection that their Paleolithic ancestors had in abundant quantity prior to the invention of agriculture and the, their corresponding abstract power-based dominance hierarchies. The hunter-gatherers would likely be quick to point out to the farmer that the primary aspiration of modern agrarian society is to escape from the systemic prison they created for themselves. Ironically, agriculture was invented by sapiens in pursuit of energy efficiency, to not have to spend so much time and energy hunting and gathering their own food. It's also intended to reduce physical injury and to not have to risk personal injury securing access to food. Tragically, in their pursuit of safer and more energy efficient methods of gaining and maintaining access to food resources, sapiens ended up creating systems which take more energy to maintain and result in more fighting and injury to keep secure. They traded the burden of having to chase down caribou with the burden of having to kill each other at unprecedented and unnatural scales to keep their arbitrarily partitioned plots of highly vulnerable irrigated land safe. 
against neighboring abstract power hierarchies or abusive god kings. An intellectually honest person should therefore not be so quick to cherish agrarian society's way of life with unthinking conventional reverence, because in many ways it backfires on them. Foster offers the following explanation for how sapiens place themselves in this predicament. Humans, no, let's be honest, we wanted convenience and what we saw as security. We wanted to reduce or eliminate contingency. We sought to rule the natural world and began to see ourselves as distinct from it rather than part of it. Our early efforts at control were, in one sense only, very successful. We managed to produce a lot of calories in one place. That caused a population explosion. Once the population started to increase, there was no way back. We had to produce more calories and to increase the size of the places in which we produce them. There was no escape from the places. Enter status, surplus, markets, all sorts of camp followers, including overcrowding, loneliness, occupational disease, disease of sedentary life, and epidemics of infectious diseases. Continue synergistically for 12,000 years or so, and you have us. Reference 68. Foster and many other anthropologists explain how sapiens systemically trap themselves with agriculture. He argues the first cities from which civilization emerged represent the point when sapiens lost all their options and were forced down a hazardous path from which they can't escape. Reference 68. Farming, like heroin, is easier to get into than out of. Surpluses boost population, and high population kills all the animals and eats all the nuts and berries from miles around, making return impossible. Once the jaws of monoculture close around you, that's it. You've just got to go on producing more. And when you start trading, the law of supply and demand increases the pressure, binds you more tightly to the wheel. Reference 68. This guy Foster. For these and many other reasons, modern civilization can be seen as a cautionary tale. If our upper Paleolithic ancestors could see how modern agrarian domesticated sapiens live today, they would probably not envy our lives. Humans replace the emotionally fulfilling challenge of hunting and gathering, for which we are psychologically and physiologically optimized, with unnaturally sedentary and laborious lives filled with social isolation, infectious disease, health deficiencies, war fighting, and probably most devastating of all, high-ranking sociopaths who psychologically abuse and systemically exploit their populations through their belief systems at extraordinary scale. Clearly, there are benefits to our modern way of life, but it's certainly not all sunshine and rainbows. The tragedy of modern civilization is that most sapiens alive today have only ever known isolated, sedentary, tedious, laborious lifestyles teeming with inequality and systemic exploitation for their belief systems compared to the egalitarian, adventurous, dynamic lifestyles sapiens once had. Modern agrarian domesticated sapiens engorge themselves on cheap, artificial, and easy food. They chase after imaginary wealth and power, all while chasing the illusion of security and prosperity, blissfully unaware of the systemic hazards they place themselves in, and the eye-watering levels of exploitation their belief systems routinely get subjected to. In the process of domesticating and entrapping animals, sapiens domesticated and entrapped themselves. And now they are incapable of knowing how utterly unhappy they are because they have never seen, known, or experienced anything except the inside of their agrarian cage. Chapter 4.8.2 Sacrificing individual and collective security to spend less energy and cause less injury. The sapient instinct to not fatally injure fellow human beings is often stronger than the sapient instinct for self-preservation. People have such a powerful inclination to avoid hurting each other that they often refuse to injure people who represent a direct 
threat to their own life and limb. An instinct which military spend a great deal of time and effort to overcome with training. It should therefore come as no surprise to the reader that sapiens will accept the flaws of abstract power hierarchies for the sake of not having to injure each other. They will go against 4 billion years of natural selection and not use physical power to settle intraspecies disputes, establish control authority over intraspecies resources, and achieve consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of intraspecies property. They will attempt, emphasis on the word attempt, different pecking order strategies than might is right, or feed and breed the power projectors first and try to ration their resources using non-physical techniques, which don't risk physical injury. Reference 70. As discussed in the previous section, sapiens are so good at abstract thinking and so instinctively disinclined to physically injure each other, they invent imaginary sources of power to serve as a surrogate to physical power. They use this imaginary power to settle disputes, establish control authority over resources, and achieve consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of their perceived property. When they do this, they tacitly trade something real, Watts, for something abstract. Rank. Creating a physically different system with different emergent behavior. The motivation for doing this primarily ideological, less killing, less and less energy expenditure, is something inherently good. Trading an energy-intensive resource control strategy prone to cause an injury for an energy-conserving resource control strategy that ostensibly doesn't lead to physical injury is considered to be better a better approach to solving the existential imperative of establishing pecking order for reasons that are difficult to explain without subjective and abstract reasoning. A flaw of this reasoning is that abstract power hierarchies clearly do lead to massive amounts of energy, energy expenditure and physical injury because of their systemic dis dysfunctionality, more so than humans experienced prior to their invention. Abstract power's perceived advantages are derived from the fact that abstract power doesn't physically exist. Because abstract power doesn't physically exist, it is incapable of consuming energy or causing injury. This is considered to be a good thing because people think they can create abstract power hierarchies to serve as more energy efficient and safer systems for settling disputes, establishing control authority over internal resources, and achieving consensus on the state of ownership and chain of custody of perceived property. But, like most things, the decision to use abstract power versus physical power to manage resources comes with major systemic trade-offs. Because abstract power doesn't physically exist, that means it can't be physically constrained. Because abstract power doesn't consume energy or cause physical injury, that means it can be scaled and abused in ways that are highly exploitative, yet completely unattributable and imperceptible to entire populations of people. The physical differences between physical power and abstract power were outlined in the previous sections. These differences mean people should not expect to see the same complex emergent behavior between PPB and APP dominance hierarchies, physical power based and abstract power based dominance hierarchies. But how often do people stop and think critically about these differences, as opposed to outright rejecting the idea of using physical power as the basis for managing resources because of ideas that is morally, ethically, or theologically bad. When sapiens trade physical power for abstract power, they make a trade-off in complex emergent behavior. What they sacrifice in the trade is systemic security. They take a resource control protocol that is demonstrably secure and vetted for 4 billion years of natural selection and they trade it for a demonstrably insecure resource control protocol which is vulnerable to predation.
They take a zero trust, permissionless, inclusive, egalitarian, unbounded, and systemically exogenous resource control protocol, and they replace it with a non-inclusive, bounded, inegalitarian, and systemically endogenous protocol, where a ruling class must be trusted to not abuse their power, and a ruled class must tacitly have permission from that ruling class to have access to their property. They take a resource control structure that can be seen, vetted, physically constrained, and verifiably decentralized, and they replace it with a resource control structure that's invisible, that can neither be physically constrained nor verifiably decentralized. Then they act surprised when an entirely different system with vastly different physical properties doesn't exhibit the same complex emergent behavior as a system they're trying to replace. To put it simply, People replace physical power with abstract power and then act surprised when it backfires on them by causing either foreign invasion or wide-scale systemic oppression. In exchange for energy efficiency and desire to maintain their resources with less physical injury, sapiens adopt abstract power hierarchies which undermine their own systemic security. This trade-off leads straight to severe losses in the form of foreign invasion or systemic exploitation, all of which must inevitably be resolved using far larger quantities of energy-intensive and injurious physical power than they probably would have needed if they had just been more inclined to recognize there is no viable replacement to physical power as the basis for resolving disputes in a zero-trust and egalitarian way. The systemic security flaws of abstract power hierarchies could be explain, could explain why sapiens started killing each other at unprecedented scale following the emergence of agrarian society. We already know from the domestication of animals that there is a direct causal relationship between systemic insecurity and interference of naturally selected peck and order heuristics. It is possible that over-reliance on imaginary power and abstract power hierarchies represents a form of self-domestication that actually causes, rather than merely correlates to, severe population scale security vulnerabilities which inevitably lead to sudden and explosive reversions back to physical confrontations. Reference 68. It's therefore entirely possible that a direct contributing factor of warfare a phenomenon which appears to have emerged alongside many other unfortunate side effects associated with modern agrarian society. Famine, infection, disease, dietary deficiencies, physiological degeneration. Is counterintuitively the abstract power hierarchies we ostensibly use to avoid warfare. In what would be a supremely ironic and tragic turn of events, it is feasible that sapiens cause far more inefficiency, waste, and death for themselves by trying to avoid physical conflict than by simply using physical power to settle their disputes. Their aversion to physical conflict may lead them to over-rely on abstract power as an alternative, but far less egalitarian or systemically insecure basis for establishing pecking order and managing resources. Causing population scale resource management, exploitation, mismanagement, exploitation, and abuse to fester and blossom until the point where it inevitably boils over into far more destructive wars. Chapter 4.8.3 Nature suggests that might is right might actually be the right approach. Now is a good time to remind the reader of the core theoretical concepts of power projection in nature and the importance of correcting for survivorship bias. What we see in nature is what has survived a rigorous natural selection process. On the contrary, that means what we do not see in nature could be what didn't survive the same natural selection process. With this in mind, let's ask ourselves what do we not see in nature? We don't see animals avoiding the use of physical power to establish pecking order and manage their internal resources. We see that we see them optimizing for it. We see the strongest, most intelligent, 
and most physically aggressive animals rise into the top of practically every food chain in every biome. It's probably not the case that other resource management strategies, which use less energy or cause less injury, haven't been tested in the wild before. It's more likely the case that several alternative heuristics for establishing dominance hierarchies have been attempted many times before, but we don't observe them because they didn't survive. In other words, they weren't the right strategy. For the sake of scientific rigor, people should be willing to accept an amoral hypothesis that might is right or feed and breed the strongest and most intelligent power projectors first is the most appropriate heuristic for establishing pecking order and over our resources. Simply because it's a demonstrably effective way to survive in a world filled of predators and entropy from which animals don't have the option of escaping. In other words, it might be worth accepting that down, the downsides of using physical power as the basis for establishing pecking order over resources because it's the most demonstrably successful protocol for survival. If you don't use physical power as the basis for establishing intraspecies pecking order, then you should, at the very least, not expect to have the same capacity for survival and prosperity as the animals who do. Because that is clearly what we observe in nature, and there is no reason to believe that sapiens would be an exception to nature. The use of physical power to settle disputes and establish resource control authority is no doubt energy intensive and directly prone to injury, but it's clearly more capable of prospering in a world filled with predators. There are also major systemic benefits of physical power that abstract power is clearly incapable of replicating. Physical power doesn't require trust. Physical power doesn't require permission. Physical power is inclusive, egalitarian, unbounded, and systemically exogenous. When physical power is used as the basis for establishing pecking order, it is it creates a natural meritocracy which physically constrains and verifiably decentralizes how much control authority over resources any one single PAC member can have. These systemic benefits explain why sapiens so frequently revert back to using physical power to settle intraspecies disputes and manage intraspecies resources, despite how energy intensive and destructive it is. Wild animals who utilize physical power to establish their dominance hierarchies do not appear to be capable of perceiving that is theologically, philosophically, or ideologically reprehensible. They don't appear to have neocortices capable of abstract thought, so they are incapable of being pressured, being peer pressured, into believing that physical power-based resource control protocols are bad. Instead, animals simply accept the energy expenditure and risk of injury Instead of trying to find a replacement to physical power, they evolve special technologies which continue to allow them to use physical power as the basis of settling disputes and establishing pecking order, but mitigate the threat of physical injury. Antlers. People who look upon who look down upon wild animals and condemn their pecking order heuristics as brutish or unfair. What they ignore is that animals which use physical power as the basis for settling property disputes or establishing control authority over their resources don't appear to experience psychological exploitation of their abstract belief systems or incompetent mismanagement or near routine catastrophic collapses of abstract power hierarchies which lead to famine and warfare. Animals which don't believe in imaginary systems don't suffer from countless problems which arise from giving members of a pack too much physically unconstrained abstract power and asymmetric control authority over their resources. Chapter 4.8.4 Unconstrained abstract power hierarchies can breed complacency and corruption. Who could have guessed? Great civilizations are not murdered. They commit suicide. Arnold Toynbee. 5,000 years of written testimony indicates that sapiens have not transcended primordial economics. 
Their resources are depleted because they stop capturing them. Their abstract power hierarchies become teeming with politicking and get regulatorily captured by incompetent, corrupt, or self-servant intermediaries who abuse their rank, mismanage internal resources, and systemically exploit the rules. This breeds social distrust and civil unrest. Inevitably, opportunistic neighbors arrive at the gate. Physical aggressors or corrupt officials justify their actions using theological, philosophical, or ideological pretenses, but the primordial economic reasons for their attacks remains the same. High benefit to cost ratio of attack. Reference 22. The study of Sapien's written history is the study of catastrophic dysfunctionality of abstract power hierarchies and a continuous return to physical power as the basis for settling disputes, reestablish control authority over resources, and achieving consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of property. No matter how much people like to pride themselves on developing more energy efficient or peaceful abstract power hierarchies, they meticulously codify using rules of law. History makes it very clear that these systems are highly dysfunctional and utterly incapable of producing a secure society for long durations of time. These systems appear to last for short durations of time where it's possible for populations to trust their high-ranking adjudicators not to become incompetent or abusive with their authority. Otherwise, these systems only last as long as it takes for hungry neighbors to sense physical weakness and devour their prey. As anthropologist Peter Turchin observes, there is a pattern that we see reoccurring throughout history. When survival is no longer at stake, selfish elites and other special interest groups capture the political agenda. The spirit that we are all in the same boat disappears and is replaced by a winner-take-all mentality. As the elites enrich themselves, the rest of the population is increasingly impoverished. Rampant inequality of wealth further corrodes cooperation. Beyond a certain point, a formerly great empire becomes so dysfunctional that smaller, more cohesive neighbors began tearing it apart. Eventually, the capacity for cooperation declines to such a low level that barbarians can strike at the very heart of the empire without encountering significant resistance. But barbarians at the gate are not the real cause of imperial collapse. They are a consequence. Reference 22. Early agrarian societies had highly exploitative, rank-based power hierarchies led by tyrannical god kings, but then transitioned to less exploitative, rank-based hierarchies over thousands of years. Why? Because of people who risked life and limb to impose severe physical costs on their oppressors and invaders. Rarely did people negotiate their way out of god kingdoms oppressive empires, and total monarchies. They bought their way out by paying a high price in bloodshed. Somehow, populations keep allowing themselves to forget these dynamics. Despite how many times sapiens have relearned the same lesson the hard way, they keep forgetting it. Perhaps it is because of short memory spans that we let ourselves forget that oppression begins with our belief systems. Oppression happens when storytellers use rhetoric to persuade people to delegitimize their physical power. Watts. Reify imaginary power. Rank. Give control authority over resources to the people with the most amount of rank. Early god kings mastered the strategy using theological constructs to convince thousands of people they were living gods, metaphysically superior to others and transcendent to nature. Citizens living within these abstract power hierarchies legitimately believed their leader's imaginary power was something concretely real. Just like how today people still believe that the imaginary power of high-ranking people is con concretely real. As a result, Early agrarian society became domesticated and enslaved. They forfeited the meritocracy of their physical power for the imaginary power of their god kings, and as a result, they were literally put in cages. 
The abstract power of god kings was legitimized and hypostasized by the physical power of role-playing enforcers. But that physical power was often dwarfed by the physical power of the population being oppressed. This begs the question, why didn't these populations rise against their oppressors sooner? The god kings enforcers represented only a small portion of the population and could have, and eventually were, overthrown by slaves and working class people who far outnumbered their oppressors. This means a major contributing factor to high levels of systemic exploitation and abuse of god king abstract power hierarchies was pacifism. A lack of willingness to impose physical costs on oppressors because of ideological beliefs. Dirty pacifism. The ruled class was not inclined to spend the energy or risk the injury required to countervail the control authority of their oppressors by making it possible to justify the physical cost of exploiting them. Just like all other types of domesticated animals, a major factor which contributed to the egregious levels of systemic exploitation and abuse experienced by early agrarian population was their lack of physical aggression. Their abstract beliefs about the imaginary power of their god kings made them docile, submissive, and easily exploitable. These dynamics of oppression have not changed over the years. Just the abstractions used to convince people to forfeit their physical power and their ability to impose severe physical costs on their attackers. Today, populations adopt pacifist belief systems for other abstract reasons. In the Bronze and Iron Ages, Oppressors use theology to reify abstract power and persuade people to forfeit their physical power, i.e. obey the ruling class because God said so. After that went out of style, has it? Oppressors started using increasingly more philosophical or ideological constructs, i.e. obey the ruling class because they represent moral and ethical good. For some reason, philosophical or ideological approaches to creating abstract power hierarchies are perceived to be less vulnerable to systemic exploitation and abuse than theological approaches. This doesn't make rational sense because although they are more secular, philosophy and ideology are equally as abstract as theology, i.e. good is just as subjective defined as God, and therefore equally as vulnerable to the exact same reification, fallacies, God kings, and monarchies used to prey upon to systemically exploit their population. To prey upon their population to systemically exploit their population. Greeks and Romans philosophized about moral good and divided their abstract power across an ostensibly representative group of voters. Meanwhile, they ran their empires on human slave labor who weren't allowed to vote. While senators pontificated about the equality of man and the moral imperative to establish governments more representative of the people, they deliberately codified laws which only represented and benefited specific types of people, specifically rich, white, literal males. Eventually, overt physical exploitation through slavery became too hard to do because of the blood trail it leaves. Physical power is explicit and active aggressive, making it easy for populations to see the offenses being committed against them and organize to secure themselves. As a result, today, the preferred way to exploit a population is to do it non-physically, usually through a population's belief system. Simply write laws with exploitable logic in them, deliberately encode vulnerabilities and attack vectors that you can exploit later. Slap ethically pleasant sounding names on bills to fool the masses with morally camouflaged sleights of hand. These strategies work because they're subversive and passive aggressive. Populations won't recognize they're being exploited, or perhaps they will recognize that they're being exploited, but they won't be able to identify the root cause. The system itself. We need a better security system. Bitcoin is that security system for all of our resources. You don't buy Bitcoin. You secure your resource on the Bitcoin protocol, on the Bitcoin blockchain, using the Bitcoin protocol. It's encryption, it's software, it's zeros and ones. 
It's our most secure abstraction. Chapter 4.8.5 Abstract power hierarchies can motivate citizens to forfeit their physical strength and aggression. One way to systemically exploit modern sapiens is a form of domestication where people are persuaded via ideology to lay down their physical power and condemn their physically aggressive power projectors. The assertion is made that the use of physical power to establish control over resources or impose severe physical costs on others is morally reprehensible due to how energy intensive and injurious it is. While perhaps well intended, this argument is logically unsound when considering the core concepts of survival, natural selection, and the existential imperative of physical power to solve the survivor's dilemma. We all have to fight entropy. It's also blatantly ignorant to lessons offered by history. As a side note, this is a predominant argument against Bitcoin. People are making the assertion that Bitcoin is bad because of how energy intensive it is. Oblivious to how that physical power is being used to impose severe physical costs on attackers. Ideologists will argue that sapiens are somehow above natural selection or morally superior to or even exempt from it. They will persuade people to lay down their power projection technology out of moral necessity in favor of peaceful abstract power hierarchies codified into rules of law, which, of course, place the ideologists which define what right is at the top of the ranks within the resource control hierarchy. Oblivious to the meaningful systemic differences between physical and abstract power-based resource control structures, a population will pride itself on their moral and ethical superiority and their effort to replace physical power with abstract power to establish pecking order. In exchange for the promise of less energy expenditure and less potential injury, they will remove the physical constraints preventing belligerent actors from invading or exploiting them. Dependent on how trustworthy and benevolent people are, a society which hamstrings their own ability to impose severe physical costs on threats may enjoy a few generations of economic surplus and resource abundance due to the efficiencies gained by blatantly ignoring their security responsibilities. But as written history very cleverly shows, these societies sh struggle to survive long term. Sooner or later, their governments become corrupt or Hannibal arrives at the gate, and their future depends on their ability and willingness to summon as much physical power and aggression as quickly as they can to countervail the attack. But it's often too little, too late. As hard as they try, and as well-intentioned as they may be, sapiens cannot escape their own nature. Primordial economics, natural selection, the survivor's dilemma, and the basic dynamics of survival are always in play regardless of how civilized sapiens feel they have become, or how well designed their abstract power-based dominance hierarchies are. If a sapient population makes itself a ripe target of opportunity by not continually growing their cost of attack, by improving their ability to impose severe physical cost on neighbors, it risks getting devoured the same as any other living thing in nature does. Ideologists ignore four billion years of natural selection and attempt to replace physical power with abstract power for the sake of energy efficiency and injury avoidance. They argue they have a moral imperative to reduce waste, but then create trust-based, permission-based, inegalitarian, bounded, physically unconstrained, systemically insecure, imaginary power structures over resources which become extremely wasteful. Chapter 4.8.6 Abstract power hierarchies create honeypot security problems with all honey but no sting. Honeybees offer a simple explanation for why abstract power hierarchies are so systemically insecure. Honeybees represent a literal honeypot security problem. They produce something everybody wants. To resolve their honeypot security problem, honeybees are equipped with stingers designed to inflict severe physical pain on attackers. Honeybees will sink their stingers so deep into the skin of their attackers that they can't detach without suffering from fatal disembowelment. 
This happens because a honeybee stinger is not designed for self-defense. It is designed to achieve the complex emergent benefit of strategic security. This complex emergent benefit is a byproduct of the fact that honeybees are designed to maximize the amount of pain, i.e. severe physical prohibitive cost, imposed on attackers to the point where it is fatal to the bees who produce that pain. The reason why this works is because of the simple primordial economic dynamics discussed in the previous chapter. Maximizing one's ability to impose physical costs lowers the benefit to cost ratio of attack of the hive and successfully deters attack. In other words, honeybees prove that the solution to the natural honeypot security problem is to impose the maximum amount of physical pain on attackers as possible, even if that means risking physical injury. Abstract power hierarchies represent a honeypot security problem, where the honey is asymmetric control authority over a population and their abundant resources. When abstract power hierarchies are codified into rules of law, they invite attacks from two types of threats, external invasion and internal corruption. The former uses physical power to perform the attack, whereas the latter uses the hierarchy's own belief system to perform the attack. In both cases, primordial economics offers a simple explanation for why these attacks occur. Abstract power and formally codified abstract power hierarchies generate enormous resource abundance and control authority, but they have no capacity to impose unbounded, infinitely expandable, and severe physical costs on attackers. Consequently, their benefit to cost ratio of attack approaches infinity. Like producing a hive full of delicious honey, Abstract power hierarchies create attractive and desirable resource that people want. But because the worker bees have no physical capacity to sting attackers, or more likely because they believe it's bad to sting people, they have no capacity or inclination to keep themselves systemically secure. Abstract power is all honey and no sting. Herein lies the primary strategic security flaw of abstract power hierarchies and their codified rules of law. They're better, the better they're designed, the more people use them and the more asymmetric resource control authority they produce. But as the population becomes increasingly reliant on abstract power to settle their disputes, establish control authority over their resources, and determine the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of their property, they risk self-domestication. They lose their capacity and inclination to impose severe physical costs on their oppressors. If they aren't aware of this risk, they will turn themselves into soft targets of opportunity to be invaded or systemically exploited. All it takes for this to happen at scale is for enough people to become convinced that physical power is bad. The systemic security threat caused by human domestication is why people should maintain a healthy caution for abstract power hierarchies. No abstract power hierarchy is safe from the systemic security flaws of abstract power. No matter how well designed they are, all abstract power hierarchies are systemically insecure against external invasion or internal exploitation if they don't incorporate the use of physical power to mitigate these threats. Over-reliance on non-physical adjudication methods like laws and courtrooms sounds desirable because of how energy efficient and peaceful they sound, but this comes at the cost of creating a major strategic honeypot security problem. High-ranking positions start wielding asymmetric levels of abstract power and control authority over their population increasing the benefit of attack of capturing those positions and simultaneously causing the population's benefit to cost ratio of attack to creep higher and higher. If they aren't careful, the population will turn into a hive of honeybees with no stingers, laboring to produce valuable honey for their queen, but physically incapable of, or morally disinclined, to keep themselves systemically secure by remaining physically strong and aggressive to keep their cost of attack high and their benefit to cost ratio of attack low. Eventually, like everything else in nature who didn't get the memo on how primordial economics works, a population that doesn't do this will get devoured. To expect a population with a permanently increasing benefit to cost ratio of attack not to be attacked either internally or externally is to expect humans to not behave like humans. Without physical power, Neither rules of law, nor the high-ranking people writing the laws and controlling the resources, nor the honest and well-intentioned users participating in these systems can secure themselves against attack. 
Because their power is strikingly imaginary, abstract power hierarchies can only increase society's benefit of attack, and therefore only increase their benefit to cost ratio of attack. From both a systemic security and primordial economic perspective, this is clearly not ideal for any organization seeking long-term survival and prosperity. The population is forced to trust in the benevolence of their neighbors or their rulers not to physically attack or systemically exploit them, despite an ever-increasing benefit of doing so. And trust is a highly ineffective security strategy. Abstract power hierarchies are often founded on ideological principles, which claim physical aggression is bad. The downside of this belief system is that it makes a population morally disinclined to be physically aggressive. That is, to do the thing that has already been proven to be the surviving solution to honeypot security problems. Honeybees quite literally represent nature's chosen solution to the exact same honeypot security problem that agrarian sapiens face with their irrigated land. Or whatever other valuable resource they want to protect. Example? bits of information transferred across cyberspace. The fittest solution to a honeypot security problem is, without a doubt, to maximize everyone's ability to sting the attacker, to impose as much severe physical cost as possible, despite the risk of personal injury. In their state of ideologically induced docility, Sapiens ignore nature's proven solution to the honeypot problem and become disinclined to impose severe physically prohibitive costs on foreign invaders or internal exploiters, thus shrinking their own cost of attack. This tendency of abstract power hierarchies to increase benefit of attack and decrease cost of attack simultaneously is a major systemic security hazard because it can cause a population's benefit to cost ratio of attack to increase rapidly. This is the same primordial economic dynamics seen when humans domesticate animals, as well as when they hunt caribou. This concept is illustrated in bowtie notation in figure 51. Tying this point back to the core concepts presented in the previous chapter, abstract power hierarchies and their codified rules of law represent the option number one strategy for solving the survivor's dilemma. They represent a strategy for chasing after prosperity, which actively reduces prosperity margin. See figure 18 for a refresher. History makes it clear that abstract power hierarchies, which focus too much attention on resource abundance, but too little attention on imposing severe physical costs on attackers, are practically guaranteed to be devoured either from the outside via foreign invasion or from the inside via corruption. As desperately as people want to believe otherwise, no matter how well they are designed and codified, Abstract power hierarchies can do nothing to physically prevent or constrain attacks. Abstract power can't stop unsympathetic neighbors or systemic exploitation. And too much reliance on abstract power causes a population to risk self-domestication. To be clear, the author is not arguing that society should end the practice of attempting to govern itself or manage resources using abstract power hierarchies codified via rules of law. Rules and rank-based abstract power hierarchies have no doubt helped facilitate cooperation and achieve extraordinary levels of resource abundance for sapiens across the world. 
The point is that abstract power hierarchies are trust-based and permission-based systems which are demonstrably insecure against corruption and invasion, and it is vital for societies to recognize these systemic security flaws. Chapter 4.8.7 Abstract power hierarchies are demonstrably incapable of stopping physical power projectors. As much as people try, imaginary powers encoded by rules of law don't work against outsiders who aren't sympathetic to them. Genghis Khan doesn't care about your rank, your rights, or your rule of law. Abstract power is utterly incapable of disincentivizing foreign invasion and clearly incapable of physically preventing it. What does stop Genghis Khan? Projecting physical power to impose severe physical costs on him at the risk of using a lot of energy and risking a lot of injury to do so. From the perspective of primordial economics, natural resources like farmland create a honeypot target with high benefit to cost ratio of attack. Imagine laboring for years to create freshly irrigated and fertile land filled with specially designed grains capable of producing abundant amounts of food, but then doing nothing to impose severe physical costs on neighbors. Sapiens, who don't physically secure their farmland, actively invite predation by deliberately creating a high benefit-to-cost ratio of attack resource. In the early days of agrarian society, freshly irrigated land would have been like placing millions of dollars worth of cash into the middle of Times Square with no supervision or oversight and then expecting nobody to take it. At a certain point, the blame for the losses associated with an attack goes to the people who are stupid enough to put millions of dollars worth of cash in the middle of Times Square with no supervision or oversight and expect it not to be attacked. What do you expect is going to happen when you put a high benefit to cost ratio of attack source of food in the middle of a continent filled with hungry and aggressive peak predators. Is Sargon the conqueror really to blame, or are unrealistic expectations about how to survive and prosper in nature to blame? At a certain point, foreign invasion can be attributed to people who ignore primordial economics and proceed to design hazardous systems which produce egregiously high benefit-to-cost ratio of attacks. Sapiens are first and foremost predators. To expect a group of sapiens not to attack something with a high BCRA is to expect sapiens not to behave like sapiens. As Nietzsche observed, even the body within which individuals treat each other as equals will have to be an incarnate will to power. It will strive to grow, spread, seize, become predominant, not from any morality or immorality, but because it is living and because life simply is will to power. Reference 105. Populations that seek to survive and prosper have a responsibility to understand life's relationship to power and design systems which are resilient to predation. Once freshly irrigated farmland has been created, sapiens must maintain and secure their farmland. After many generations pass, agrarian society becomes wholly attached to their farms, incapable of surviving any other way except by farming. Foster summarizes this dynamic as follows. You've taken the hard coats off seeds and altered the instinct of cattle. They can't survive in the wild any more than you can. You have to be around to defend them. Forget a year-long ivory hunting or soul-searching break in the Derbyshire tundra. You've got to be on duty on your farm, protecting your crops and your stock from the vulnerabilities you've chosen for them. And if the envious people in the next village decide to beat their plowshares into swords, you've got nowhere to run to. As hunter-gatherers, you had the whole world as refuge, and no resources, either physical or imaginative, to survive anywhere other than the farmstead. The need to physically secure farmland creates a need for specialized workforces of power projectors dedicated to imposing severe physical costs on anyone who tries to take that farmland. But if you create a specialized 
power projection workforce dedicated to defending your farm, you have technically created a dual-use power projection capability that can also be used to physically capture other farms. This creates a window of opportunity for you to become a predator, or to be more accurate, for you to continue to be a predator. Just like other dual-use power projection tactics observed in nature, military workforces enable human organizations to affect both sides of the primordial economic equation. Not only can soldiers impose severe physical costs on neighbors to secure farmland, but they can also use their militaries to capture neighbor and farmland. This dual-use power projection capability makes the military an extremely effective survival tool that was seemingly destined to become a strategic shilling point for agrarian society, just like any other dual-use power projecting tactic observed in nature. It didn't take long for history's first recorded primordial economist, Sargon of Akkad, to figure out the dual-use benefits of militaries. Like a single-celled bacteria that had just discovered phagocytosis, Sargon subsumed neighboring Sumerian city-states with ease, focusing his attention on the ones with the highest benefit-to-cost ratio of attack. By physically compelling poorly defended city-states to forfeit control over their resources to the Akkadian Empire, Sargon popularized a trend which continues to this day. In modern times, populations with the most powerful militaries still have the most control authority over Earth's resources. The predatory game of eat or be eaten has essentially never changed. Chapter 4.8.8 Encoding logical constraints into a system doesn't stop people from exploiting the system's logic. It is impossible over the longer term for laws to protect a population from manipulated money when the laws are influenced by the people that benefit most from that manipulation. Only an emergent parallel system outside of that control could solve that paradox. Jeff Booth, reference 106. Something which has an even higher benefit to cost ratio of attack than an undefended farm is an abstract power hierarchy filled with people who wield imaginary power and control authority over the valuable resources produced by thousands of farms. It should come as no surprise to anyone who understands human nature that high-ranking people are going to be tempted to prey on the abstract belief systems of their populations, especially if there's no severe physical cost for doing so. Government corruption is essentially a form of psychological abuse. To avoid spending energy and risking injury to settle their disputes and manage their resources, populations will adopt belief systems where they give people imaginary power. The people with imaginary power get control authority over the population's resources. The primary attack vector for any predator who wants to gain and maintain access to those valuable resources is to become the person with the imaginary power and then exploit it when they do this they are exploiting the population through their own belief system in response to this threat people attempt to encode logical constraints into their abstract power hierarchies using rules of law for example when total monarchies proved to be too oppressive people started creating rules of law called constitutions and forming new types of abstract power hierarchies like constitutional monarchies or republics. The problem with this approach is that these logical constraints are endogenous to the belief system. Therefore, they are just as capable of be as being exploited. And technically speaking, logical constraints are just as imaginary as the abstract power they ostensibly constrain. I tweeted something today. Nobody is above the law is the mantra of the ruling class. Repeated by the oppressed, thinking they are chanting for equality under the law, with under in quotes. Then I said something about the law serving humans, not humans serving the law. And uh, we are all above the law. And this is the reason why we're all above the law. 
we're not above our responsibilities to each other in these abstract power hierarchies. In response to this threat, people attempt to encode logical constraints into their abstract power hierarchies using rules of law. For example, when total monarchies proved to be too oppressive, people started creating rules of law called constitutions and forming new types of abstract power hierarchies like constitutional monarchies or republics. The problem with this approach is that these logical constraints are endogenous to the belief system. Therefore, they are just as capable as being exploited. And technically speaking, logical constraints are just as imaginary as the abstract power they ostensibly constrain. Here is a point that will be repeated throughout this thesis, because it's the leading contributing factor of both government corruption and cyber attacks. Logical constraints cannot stop people from systemically exploiting or abusing a belief system. They can only change the way people systemically exploit or abuse a belief system. In fact, logical constraints are often specially designed to have deliberate systemic vulnerabilities. Backdoors, trapdoors, loopholes, zero days. To make them easier for malicious actors to subvert. Entrust sapiens with abstract power and give them asymmetrical asymmetric control over resources using formally codified logic, aka rules of law, and they will find a way to exploit that logic for their own personal advantage. It doesn't matter how well designed the logic is. People are demonstrably incapable of stopping other people from exploiting logic using logic. History makes it clear that different rules of law which codify different types of abstract power-based resource control structure designs will cause people to find different ways to exploit those control structures. The bottom line is that the formally encoded logic of our belief system is the source of systemic exploitation, not the solution to systemic exploitation. No amount of encoded logic can eliminate the systemic exploitation of logic, no matter how well it's designed and no matter if it's encoded using rules of law or software. The exploitation of the law and software keeps happening because people keep making the mistake of thinking that high-ranking people with imaginary power can be constrained by the written logic, i.e. laws. Logical constraints can't prevent the exploitation of logical constraints. They just change how logic can be exploited. So merely adding more rules of law to an abstract power hierarchy to attempt to constrain the abstract power of high-ranking positions is never going to fully remove the threat of exploitation of abstract power. It's just going to change the way abstract power can and will be systemically exploited. Abstract power hierarchies have not become less systemically exploitable since the early days of God Kings. They're just exploited in different ways and at much larger scales. People get confused and they misattribute the less oppressive governments we have today to better encoded logic in the rules of law. In reality, Rules of law are just as equally incapable of stopping God Kings as they were 7,000 years ago. The reason why we have less oppressive governments today is because people have spent a great deal of time, energy, and injury slaying God Kings and their armies when they become too abusive or exploitative. In other words, the reason why we have less oppressive governments today is because of people who are capable of and willing to project physical power to impose severe physical costs on those who abuse their abstract power. After many revolutions, populations have learned to create rules of law which are much more democratic, where abstract power and control authority is split across a larger number of organizations and positions, each with different control authorities, i.e. checks and balances designed to make them more resistant to exploitation and abuse. It's a great idea in theory, but in practice, adding more checks and balances doesn't fully prevent people from exploiting or abusing their imaginary power. It just changes the way these rank-based control structures can and will be systemically exploited. If the author sounds like a broken record at this point, that is intentional. Chapter 4.8.9 Voting systems are systemically exploitable. Great is the power, great is the authority of a Senate that is unanimous in its opinions. Cicero, 
reference 107. Today, rank-based voting protocols are a core component of most modern democratic rules of law. Unfortunately, rank-based voting systems are vulnerable to systemic exploitation. A vote is another form of abstract power because abstract power is non-inclusive, bounded, and systemically endogenous, i.e. internal to a belief system with encoded logic that can be exploited, can be systemically exploited. That means votes are equally as non-inclusive, bounded, and systemically endogenous. People can and have many times taken advantage of the systemically exploitable properties of voting systems to the detriment of the people who depend on them to secure their rights. As Cicero observed, high-ranking people within a Senate can make themselves unimpeachable simply by gaining the majority vote. This means a systemically oppressed population cannot impeach higher-ranking and abusive intermediaries if those intermediaries succeed in capturing majority vote. This phenomenon holds true no matter how voting power is ostensibly decentralized across a deliberative representative assembly of people meeting together to make decisions on behalf of the entire membership. Consider a Roman-style Senate with a hundred high-ranking people wielding control authority over a population in the form of voting power. All it takes to achieve unimpeachable control over the entire population is for 51 of those high-ranking people to collaborate as a centralized entity. In many ways, this type of centralized and unimpeachable abstract power is even more favorable than a king's abstract power because it's more difficult to see than the threat of consolidated abstract power, especially when that abstract power is given a misleading name like stake as will be discussed in the next chapter. Sorry, Ethereum fans. People believe that creating a rule of law to logically constrain an abstract power across a hundred people protects them from high-ranking people consolidating and abusing abstract power. It doesn't. It just changes the way to consolidate and abuse abstract power. Instead of one person, a monarch, acting in their individual self-interest to systemically exploit the abstract power hierarchy, it takes 51% of people in a ministry or legislator acting in their mutual self-interest to exploit the abstract power hierarchy. The exact same security flaws exist regardless of the fact that people attempt to logically constrain it by splitting abstract power across a ministry or legislature. Therefore, logical constraints like decentralization of abstract power don't stop systemic exploitation of abstract power. It just changes how to systemically exploit it. Even if we ignore the fact that on multiple occasions throughout history, these techniques have proven to be demonstrably insufficient at securing citizens against consolidation and abuse of abstract power, it should be clear to the reader why these logical constraints don't work using simple logic. Dividing the imaginary power of one person across multiple positions in a ministry or legislator does not prevent those people from consolidating and exploiting their imaginary power. All this does is change how people can and will exploit their imaginary power when there's inevitably an increasing benefit to do so. In other words, logic cannot constrain itself. Encoded logic constraints do, can do nothing to fully eliminate the exploitation of logic because encoded logic is as imaginary as the power they ostensibly constrain. Rank-based voting systems make it possible for conspirators to act with the same unimpeachable control authority of a king to serve a group's own interests, as a corrupt king would do but split their abstract power across separate identities to present the false appearance of a decentralized representative democracy. This is a well-known security vulnerability. Governments like the Roman Republic have attempted to mitigate the security vulnerability via term limits or sortition, but it clearly doesn't change the systemically exploitable features of the design. It just changes the names of the people with the means to exploit it. Whatever they're called and however they're done, the exploitation of voting protocols is as old as electoral systems themselves. The first rank-based voting system employed by the Greeks were regular 
totally captured by affluent white males as soon as they were invented. Starting a 2,500-year-old trend of subtle, passive, aggressive, and highly calculating systemic exploitation of voting systems. Reminder that women didn't even have a right to vote in the U.S. until only 103 years ago. Chapter 4.8.10 Abstract power hierarchies can break down regardless of how well they're designed. We have 5,000 years of written testimony about the struggles of preventing abstract power hierarchies from becoming dysfunctional. Based on well-recorded events of history, we know that abstract power hierarchies are exploitative, abusive, and prone to near-routine collapse. Hungry and envious outsiders can and will be unsympathetic to them. Their design can and will not protect people from attackers, no matter how their rules of law are encoded. Abstract power hierarchies can be systemically exploited by self-serving, incompetent rulers. People can and will abuse their rank and control authority for their own benefit. People can and will attempt to use their abstract power and resource control authority to oppress their populations. And they can and will get away with it for thousands of years if the population becomes too docile because they believe too much in the theological, philosophical, and ideological abstractions which make them grossly unaware of the merits of physical power. For these and many other reasons, we can verify using our own experiences and empirical knowledge. It's clear that populations can't prevent their abstract power hierarchies from being systemically exploited by their highest ranking members or flat out physically attacked by neighboring countries. We have been searching for an alternative to physical power as the basis for managing our property for thousands of years, and nothing we have tried has been able to survive. Eventually, Hannibal inevitably arrives at the gate or the government becomes so self-serving and corrupt. After sapiens suffer enough losses, they, they eventually become willing to do what surviving animals already do, project physical power to settle their disputes, establish control authority over their resources, and achieve consensus on the legitimate state of ownership and chain of custody of their property. People are eventually willing to spend the injury and risk the energy to secure the resources they value the way nature demands from every other animal in the wild. You might hear me smile there. Spend the energy and risk the injury. <laughs> Spend the injury and risk the energy, but you know. After all the rhetoric about how theologically, philosophically, and ideologically reprehensible physical power and aggression is, after all the unproductive attempts to negotiate and bargain with unpeachable oppressors, after all the unsuccessful efforts to improve the design of abstract power hierarchies by applying ineffective logical constraints, people eventually cry havoc and call for the use of physical power to patch up the security flaws of their dysfunctional systems and impose severe physical prohibitive costs on their attackers. Despite how much people like to condemn the use of physical power to settle their disputes or establish their dominance hierarchies, surviving societies emphasis on the word surviving, eventually come to terms with how nature works. To solve the survivor's dilemma, societies must master the art of projecting physical power to impose severe physically prohibitive costs on their attackers. Whether those attackers come from the outside or the inside, they must adopt tactics techniques, and technologies which allow them to continually increase their cost of attack and continuously lower their benefit-to-cost ratio of attack. Sapients aren't miraculously exempt from primordial economics. If anything, the growing size of their tribes make them even more vulnerable to their number one predator, ourselves. He writes themselves like he's some sort of alien, which he might be. Never met the guy. 